Hello and welcome to another episode of Adventures in .net. I'm Sean Kleber, your host, and with me today we've got everybody, the full panel. We all managed to to match up. Must be because it's uh, Easter weekend and here was recording. So we've got Christian Wins. Hi everyone. Mark Miller. Hey kids. Adam Fromonic. Hello, folks. Yep. And me. And we have a guest. We have a guest that's that's been here before. He's been here twice before. But it's actually been three whole years since he's been on the show. So let's bring on the show, Daniel Roth. Hey, Daniel. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's great to be back. It's been too long. It has. I don't know why we waited so long because I love every one of your episodes and they're very popular. So we need to not wait three years for the next one. Sounds good to me. Let's do it. <laughs> so what have you been up to? Uh, well, uh, I'm still working on .NET and uh, building uh, awesome web apps using the the, the, the .NET platform. Um, it's not too long ago, just back in November, that we shipped .NET 8 with a whole bunch of stuff for, for Blazor. I'm, I'm still working on Blazor as our um, pr premier web UI framework for building web applications uh, with, with .NET. It was a pretty big release for, for, for Blazor, so that was a lot of work. I don't know if that had anything to do with me not coming on the podcast, things were pretty busy, honestly, as we were <laughs> trying to cram as many features into this release as we as we could to deliver the, you know, really a, the, the vision that we were trying to, to get to with .NET 8, which is having a single solution, a single way for you to build your, your web UI part of your of your web applications um, for no matter what type of, of web architecture you, you, you wanted, whether you wanted to do server side rendering or client side rendering or really anything in between. So has Blazor use been growing and growing as it should have been? It has been growing. Yes, we're very happy with the, <laughs> the growth of the uh, Blazor uh, uh, platform. And it's, it's fun also just to talk to, to, to customers and see, hear the things that people uh, do with it. I think one of the areas that Blazor really um, resonates with, with people is um, when, you, when you're trying to do like, like more, but with, with less, right? Like if you're, if you're a large organization and you already have a, a well-established like front-end JavaScript team, um, you know those those orgs. You know they they if they have a back-end .NET, they they find Blazor interesting, but you know they have uh, you know existing patterns and, and set up there existing investments that they're already uh, uh, set up with. But people that are like, oh, I, I want to build something. I need to be fast. I need to be agile. I need to be productive, and I don't have the luxury of spinning up an entire separate team using an entirely different developer framework and platform. Blazor is just such a, a you know a wonderful thing for them. I, I'm talking to, to teams even internally at Microsoft um, that that are using Blazor for various line of business applications, and these tend to be you know small, tight teams, but need to you know, have that level of agility. They are just super happy with the, the 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 productivity that they get out of Blazor. So why don't you give us a brief you know run over of the way Blazor was prior to .NET eight? And then we can get into what's changed and why it's why it's better now. Yeah, sure. So I mean, Blazor's you know, come a long way. Like it's not a it's not a new framework anymore. I know sometimes people still say, oh, you know, Blazor. We're gonna wait and see if it's uh, you know, if it's gonna stick around or you know, what what direction is Microsoft's gonna go with Blazor? We so when, when, was, when was the first version? Was it three dot one core time frame or something? It was Where twenty yeah twenty nineteen. Like it's like five five years old. <laughs> the the first stable release. Um, even before that, uh, I mean, the, the very first, the, the, where the Blazor name came from was, uh, was actually a, a prototype that Steve Sanderson did in 2017 at a, an NDC Oslo conference, I think is what it was. Uh, he was trying to show some you know, things that browsers could do at that time that uh, were very new, like WebAssembly was, was a brand new technology at that time, and uh, he was playing around with it. And he thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could get a little bit of .NET code compiled to WebAssembly somehow and be able to run that in a in a browser. You know, took a little little tiny .NET runtime, got it compiled to WebAssembly, did Hello World in a browser, and of course this is Steve Sanderson that, that we're talking about. Uh, he's an uh, architect on the ASP.NET team. Him him being Steve, he was he then decided, well, what if I then took that and, and built a little web framework? And that's that's where Blazor originally came from, a, a DOM diffing based, um, component based uh, rendering framework. Um, that's what he built for this. It was just a demo. And then he also did like a bunch of tooling work for it. Like he got all the, the razor editor in visual studio to, to work with it, which was just mind boggling that he did this as just a, a, a demo prototype. 
So that, that was 2017. And uh, we then, you know, there was uh, lots of interest, but lots of questions about how viable this was going to be as, a, as an approach. And so we spent a fair amount of time um, uh, running Blazor as well as an experimental release, like, you know, no commitment that this would actually turn into a stable release yet, but we wanted to learn and hear from the community about how, how desirable was this. And we also wanted to learn internally how practical was it for us to actually build it because the .NET WebAssembly runtime didn't really exist yet. The one that Steve built was a total like, you know, one off. I think he found some C code on GitHub where someone had built a little .NET IL interpreter and he compiled that to WebAssembly, but it wasn't something we could really rely on for production use. And so getting that all uh, sorted out took some time. That uh, the experimental part of Blazor started in earnest in about uh, early 2018. And then we shipped uh, uh, in 2019 with .NET Core 3.0 actually, like, which was the first official Blazor release that had the Blazor component model in it as a you know, supported part of the .NET platform. That's when we introduced Blazor Server, which is the interactive server rendering uh, notion. You're, you're, you're still trying to really mimic client-side rendering, like what you would do with client-side JavaScript, but we, we did it remotely from the server over a real-time connection with the browser, over a WebSocket connection. And that was really- Kind of like ASP.NET Web Forms on steroids, right? Yeah. Is that what kind, you're saying? Kind of, like, I, I mean, I, ASP, uh, Web Forms was still a um, traditional, for the most yeah. part, traditional server-side rendering part, framework. Right? Yeah. You know, yeah. I call it Web Forms done right, yeah. They did have, though, this, this one control they had called Update Panel, which I know a lot of people squint at Blazor Server and kind of say, that, that has some, some similarities to the old Update Panel from, from the web forms days. Um, that bought us, you know, got us into the, the world of being able to do rich interactivity with .NET, you know, button clicks, drag and drop, whatever, you know, any UI inter interactions you wanted to handle, you could now do using .NET code. Uh, we then had the support for running truly on the client in a browser with WebAssembly in uh, mid-2020, I think it was, uh, was when we shipped Blazor WebAssembly for the first time. And that rolled into the .NET 5 release later that, that year. And, you know, lots of stuff has happened since then. Um, but the big shift in .NET 8 is that Blazor what was originally envisioned as a way to fill that gap in the .NET platform. Like, if I want to do client rendering, you know, rich interactivity, without having to, you know, to jump into JavaScript, how can I do that? And that's, that's what Blazor really uh, helped with. In .NET 8, it has now expanded to be a complete end-to-end -end web UI framework to, for doing not only client-side rendering, but also uh, traditional service, uh, static server-side rendering, where you, you get a request, you then route that to a Blazor component, you render HTML that goes down to the client, and that, that interaction is stateless. It's, um, it's uh, fast, it's, it's very easy to scale. Uh, Blazor now supports that traditional style of static server-side rendering in .NET 8. And on top of that, we added a whole bunch of then progressive enhancements. Like you can just start adding a little bit of, of client-side logic to improve the user experience, like um, uh, doing enhanced navigation. When, when you do a page navigation from one page to another, instead of that being an entire um, it's, it's still a separate request, but instead of blowing away everything that's in the DOM and then re-establishing everything again, when a lot of it's you know, going to be the same often when you're just navigating pages, enhanced navigation will do a, a fetch request to get the rendered HTML from the server. And then Blazor uses its you know, you know, fancy DOM diffing capabilities to then patch that into the DOM so that the, the page navigation feels smoother, it feels, it's, it's faster, it feels less disrupted. It's, it's more like a single page app navigation uh, than what you would normally get from, from traditional static server-side rendering. Um, streaming rendering was another progressive enhancement. Like when you, when you navigate to a page and you need to render that page, but you need to go get some, some data from a database or make an API call. Um, in traditional static server-side rendering, you'd have to wait for the, that, that data to be retrieved before you got anything back in the browser. Um, streaming rendering allows you to you know, send some HTML down with some placeholder content and then stream batches of updates that Blazor can then, again, patch into the DOM for you as the data becomes available. So maybe you see like a loading dot, dot, dot initially when the data from the database is now available, you patch into the DOM the, you know, your grid or whatever it is you're using to display that, that, that data. Um, that, that's then, also course, great for, for sorry for interrupting, Daniel, that's, I think it's also great for, for progress bars, right? So basically, in, in in your server quote unquote implementation, you just you know set set the progress bar to another state, and then that state appears on the client, right? While still the server is working, right? So that's, using like using a streaming rendering pattern yeah, when yeah, you like, exactly. stream yeah. updates on yeah. the progress. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. You could you could do that. 
yeah, that works. Um, and the, but the beautiful thing is, is that uh, in addition to just doing the, the, the you know old, what's honestly a fairly old pattern, right? Like static server side rendering has been around forever, but web forms sort of did this and older frameworks and web forms have been doing that for, for a long time. But then you can, because it's all Blazor components, you can then add interactivity to that app wherever you need it. Like you could light up a single component on a page and say, you know what, this component needs to be interactive. And you can choose how you want it to be interactive. You want it to use the, the in interactive server model, the Blazor server model, where it's gonna be handled from the server over a WebSocket connection. Uh, that's super convenient. Or, or if you wanna actually push that interactivity to the client, you can flag that component and say, you know what, you need to, to run client side on, on WebAssembly. You can do that on a comp per component uh, granularity, on a per page granularity, or for the whole app, which would get you to something that looks very uh, similar to what you had with like Blazor WebAssembly or, or Blazor Server. So which features that are coming to Blazor you're most excited about? So that, well, I mean, that was all done today. So that's 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 there, and I'm excited about all of that. <laughs> that's the full stack web UI support that we ship with, with .NET 8, and you can use it today. Uh, it's in a long-term support release, so it will be a uh, supported for three plus uh, three plus years, which is great. Um, of course, now we're in a new year. Uh, we're already uh, looking at the what's what's next for Blazor. Looking forward to the the .NET nine release, which is the the next release of the .NET platform. That uh, if you're familiar with our release cadence, is expected to ship in uh, November of uh, of this year of, of 2024. So the the .NET nine is kind of interesting for Blazor because we 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 shipped so much. In, in .NET 8, like it was a packed release and a lot of it like even came in fairly late. Like we were pushing in features even like in the release candidates, <laughs> which is not something I, we normally would recommend, but we were really trying to round out that vision where you could, you know, no matter what type of web, web UI you want, you could build it with, with Blazor. It's now our recommended solution for, for web UI development with .NET. Um, there are definitely things that, um, you know, some gaps, rough edges, you know, things that we didn't quite get enough time to, to hone in, in .NET 8 that we are focusing in .NET 9 on addressing, addressing gaps in the, the new Blazor web app uh, model. Uh, for example, um, performance is a big part of everything we do in .NET. Like we care deeply about making sure you get as much throughput out of your and, and server utilization out of your server resources as, as possible. Um, we didn't really get enough time in .NET 8 to do all the performance optimization on the new static server-side rendering support in Blazor that uh, that we want to do. Like it's still it's still very fast. Like it still be benefits from all the uh, performance characteristics of the .NET platform. But we know we can can do more. Um, there's a bit of a gap right now in Blazor static server-side rendering and like traditional MVC or Razor page based based rendering. Um, and so we want to close that gap and make it, you know, pretty, uh, as as uh, uh, as close as we can to the uh, the old models. The old models are will always be a little bit faster than Blazor static server side rendering because they they don't do quite as much. Like they're um, like an MVC view is a you know stream based model just spewing HTML directly out, whereas Blazor has the the component model in in play. So there's a little bit of overhead with um, the that comes with getting all the nice features that comes with Blazor's component model, but it, sh it shouldn't be big. And right now it's a little too big for, for our liking. So we're gonna uh, do a bunch of performance work to, to, to optimize that. Um, we're gonna do a bunch of things to just make sure that all the Blazor web app features work smoothly and flawlessly together. Um, we right now have a good model for going from static server-side rendering to interactivity. Like if you start with a static page and you wanna add some inter interactivity in it, that works great. We've got, a, we've got a good pattern for doing that using the new Blazor render modes. Um, we don't have a good way of going the, op the other direction. Like if you take your app and say, you know what, I want everything in this app to be interactive, like an old school Blazor server app, but except for this page, this one page here, I would like that one to be static because it doesn't really need the interactivity. We don't have a good way of doing that. There, there's, there's ways to do it, but they're kind of you know clunky. Um, so we want to make that a more first class notion in, in .NET 9. Uh, both for um, you know rendering pages and also when doing like form handling, like we introduced full traditional form handling in 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 Blazor in in .NET 8. Um, if you want to uh, have the form be interactive, but you want the submit to to be handled using a normal form submit, we don't have a way to to make that shift from interactivity to um, to to static style uh, web app development. So we're gonna add that in .NET 9. Um, I know a lot of people who are building components would like to be able to inspect at runtime. 
what the current render mode is. Like, is this component rendering statically or is it rendering laser server style or is it on WebAssembly? I would like to know. And you can kind of work it out with some, I don't know, say hacks, but like by you know, piecing it together from, from various APIs. But we're, we think that we can do better in give you a first class API for deducing those things. So you can build components that do things like uh, light up functionality based off of their current render mode. Like maybe if you're rendering statically, you want to render certain DOM elements. Uh, but when you're doing it interactively, you actually want to change that up because you can do more. You can make things more richly interactive. Like having that ability to to to, to code that logic into your components, that's something we're also uh, we're looking to do in, in the .NET 9 timeframe. Um, so you know, a bunch of things in that that bucket of like you know little gaps, little rough edges in the Blazor web app model. We want to smooth that all out, make sure it works really nice and cleanly. Like it, in general, I would say for .NET 9, our focus is on fundamentals and and quality and less less transformative. Like .NET 8 was a very transformative release. You know, we moved to uh, shuffle things around quite a bit and people are still, I think, working through that. Okay, how do I how do I move my app forward? How do I migrate from the old .NET 8 patterns to the new .NET 9 patterns? The idea of .NET 9 is we're not, we're not going to be moving your cheese nearly as much. Instead, we're going to take the things that we've already shipped and try to just make them better, faster, uh, stronger. So high level, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to think about what we're doing in the .NET 9 timeframe. Doesn't mean we're not doing new features too. We have a bunch of new features as well, but uh, it's more about quality and fundamentals this time around. I, I got a quick question or or terminology clarification. So when, when you when you say interactivity with Blazor, especially to those who don't work with Blazor, you essentially mean client events plus yes. streaming yeah. rendering. Is that is that kind of a, a sound definition of of the term? Exactly. Um, exactly. So, what so what as mean. soon as you have one of those two features or one of these two aspects in your app, then that that's the that's the uh, interactivity setting in the in the .NET CLI or in the Visual Studio uh, uh, create new Blazor web app wizard. That's that's basically it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You 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 mentioned an interesting point with the um, what 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 do you do with uh, with old applications, right? Um, so let let's imagine you started with .NET six or even earlier .NET .NET three uh, with Blazor server, right? And you have a great running Blazor server app. And then maybe, you know, you change the program CS style between .NET 5 and .NET 6, right? So you thought, you, you thought okay, now, now you're on, on safe ground, right? And now you see the new template. There is no Blazor server template. No, no, no dedicated Blazor server <laughs> template with that in the name. So what should you do? So should you just leave it as it is? I mean, it's still working, right? Yeah, so we, I mean, obviously we care deeply about back and bat in the .NET platform. You should be able to, we, we, we want to make sure you can move your app forward from version to version and things should just continue to work. So existing Blazor Surfer apps and Blazor WebAssembly apps, you can just change the target framework to .NET 8. You can up update your packages to the .NET 8 versions and that should just work. That is still fully supported. It's not that the... Blazor server or Blazor WebAssembly models have gone away. They, they are both still there, and you can run those, those, that style of app on .NET 8 in a fully supported mode. So that's the easiest way to upgrade your app, is just well, leave it as it is and uh, update the, to, to .NET 8, no, no, no problem. You then have the option of also migrating your app to use the new Blazor web app patterns, the new Blazor web app uh, uh, features. And that will then, the benefit of doing that is that then enables you to use things like the interactive render modes where you want them, then the, um, your, your, um, your components become proper endpoints in the ASP.NET Core routing system. There's a bunch of benefits that you get out of moving to the, to the new model. And we provide a migration guide that shows you how you can move from one to the other while maintaining exactly the same semantics. Um, you, can, you, know, you mentioned that the Blazor server template um, no longer exists in .NET 8, and that's true by by name. But the 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 pattern of Blazor Server is absolutely still there. You can take a Blazor web app, and you can say, "I would like this Blazor web app to use interactive server rendering. You know, use a WebSocket connection for all the you know, you know, client side events globally for the entire application." And that is the same thing as what you had with a Blazor Server app. Um, so you, you you there's some changes in the code in terms of how we accomplish that now. Like you need to use the new Blazor web script instead of blazor.server.js, use blazor.web.js. Um, you no longer need to have Razor pages or CSHTML in the picture to accomplish this. We, we, because we can now statically render components from, from the server, the root rendering of the app can now just be a, a, a .razor file, like a component file. So we use app.razor instead of 
you know, what was it like underscore host.cshtml or whatever it was in the in the old template. So you can move from one to to the to the other. And there's a set of me fairly mechanical changes that you make to for particularly for Blazor Blazor server applications. Similar deal for Blazor WebAssembly apps, particularly the ASP.NET Core hosted Blazor WebAssembly app. That was a uh, you know uh, Blazor code that would be run, pushed client side and run in the browser. But the thing that hosted those files server side was an ASP.NET Core process. So it was ASP.NET Core hosted. Um, you can have that same pattern with a Blazor web app. Um, there's a couple of different changes that you need to, to make in your existing ASP.NET Core hosted Blazor WebAssembly app to, 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 to use the new patterns, but you can uh, do it as well. The, the, one of the big changes that I think people often get tripped up on uh, in that world is that we started in .NET 8 um, pre-rendering uh, Blazor WebAssembly apps by default. Um, and what is pre-rendering? Pre-rendering is where when you make the initial request, you know, most of the, with a Blazor WebAssembly app, most of the code's gonna run client side on the browser. That's where all the rendering is gonna happen. That's where all the UI events are gonna be dealt with. Uh, but with that initial request, well, we could just go ahead and render the components up front, like give you a batch of HTML so you can get pixels on the screen immediately. Uh, with Blazor Server, that was a no-brainer. Might as well do that. Your, your, your components are going to run from the server regardless. With Blazor WebAssembly, we didn't used to do it because it adds some complexity. Like uh, That means your components are now going to run on both sides of the network. They run on the server and on the client. And you have to think about that when you're building your app. Like You, you actually need, might need different services injected depending on where your components are running. Like If that component needs some data, well, on the server, it can get it directly from the database. From the client, it might need to do an API call, You know these types of concerns. So when you're migrating, uh, you, it, ma many people didn't do pre-rendering previously. So they, um, you might, our guidance is generally to, to turn off pre-rendering when you're, when you're moving to the Blazor Web App model, um, if, you're, if you're moving a, a Blazor WebAssembly based app, because your components probably weren't set up for that. If your components were, then you're great. Then it's actually just enabled for you, and you, the work that you used to have to do manually to set up pre-rendering, you no longer have to do. That's that's one of the, the common gotchas with migration. But otherwise, the, the steps are fairly straightforward, and we have uh, detailed docs that walk you through how to do this in the uh, ASP.NET Core migration docs. Were there any other changes to the template that are maybe a bit more subtle and not related to the to the new model? Like I don't know how navigation is done or uh, pff, different, different colors. Okay, that's a stupid example, but, but, but you know where I'm getting, right? So, so where were there any other things that are, that are noteworthy? Um, so na navigation definitely yeah. is different, like by default. If you just create a Blazor web app, um, we by default turn on interactivity just for the counter page, which is this you know, page that has a button, you click on it and the count goes up. It's showing you know, how you can handle a button click event. The other two pages that are in the sample code for a Blazor web app, the, the home page, and there's like a weather forecast page that shows a table of weather forecast data. Um, previously, all those pages would have been uh, interactive and they would be uh, handled using client-side routing, where Blazor's intercepting the browser navigations and then you know, doing uh, uh, manipulating the DOM directly. In the By default, in the new template, we're using normal ASP.NET Core routing. You, you send a request to the home page, it gets Sent to the server, there's an endpoint there, it renders the home page, you get HTML content back. And then if you browse to the weather page, that's another endpoint. It makes another HP request to the weather page, it gets the weather data back. Um, now there's some, some uh, refinements to what it will do. It will do an enhanced navigation, like it won't do a full navigation. So Blazor will intercept the, the, the browser navigation, but it, it won't do the rendering over like a WebSocket connection or on WebAssembly. It'll still let the server generate the HTML It'll just patch it into the DOM uh, from whatever it gets on the response stream. The weather page also is, is um, different in a significant way in that it's using streaming rendering to generate the weather table. Uh, previously, oh, loading, loading text. Yeah, so you'll see loading dot, 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 and then you'll see the weather table show up. Now, in all earlier versions of the template, you would have seen loading dot, 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 and then the data show up as well. It looked, um, from a user experience, very similar, but what it was doing under the covers is very different. Like in a Blazor WebAssembly app, it would actually have like an HTTP client and it would call an API endpoint. And the reason why you saw loading dot, dot, dot is because that's what it rendered while it was waiting for that client HTTP request to complete, to you know, get, get, get the JSON payload, deserialize it, and then render some uh, uh, an HTML table based on whatever it got. With uh, streaming rendering, it works differently. There's no API endpoint that you're actually uh, interacting with. 
Um, the, the data is really all being handled server-side, at least mimicked as if it's being handled server-side. It's actually just being generated in memory, but you can think of it as being a server-side API call or being a server-side database query. So you get, you see loading dot, 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 which is the initial batch of HTML that goes down to the, the browser, but the connection stays open. And then once the uh, weather data is ready, and we, we even put like a fake delay in the code to show you that this is happening, uh, to simulate like an actual asynchronous API call or, or database query. Then a little bit later, you get the component renders again with the with the actual weather data and that gets patched into the, to the DOM. So I, I think a bunch of people have been uh, thrown off a little bit by that because they're like, wait a minute, how do I do the API call thing now? And, and in this case, the answer is actually, well, you don't really need to. Like the server can just handle that for you by doing uh, streaming rendering. And then you don't have to mess around with having an API endpoint that you have to you know, design and secure and all those 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 concerns. Um, so that part is also a, a, a little bit different. There's not a, uh, a in the template, not an API call there anymore. But, but we do have docs and guidance though that because there are obviously cases where you might want to make a client API call back to the server on how you can still uh, set that up and do it. It's it's the same thing. You still inject an HTTP client and just use it, um, but uh, it's no longer just in the template code. Has there been any changes in uh, state management and things like that? Because I remember in early days, if you did server side and you redeploy the server code or whatever, everybody would get this message. Code has changed or whatever. You must reload your page and, yeah. you know, to start it up again. So, yeah, that's that that's uh, specific to the, uh, the with interactive server rendering. So with you know, interactive server rendering is a, a very unique Blazor feature. Like I don't I don't think really any other web framework has this pattern. I, mean, I think maybe one that's uh, maybe Phoenix or something has something kind of, kind of similar to what, what we do. But most of the other popular front-end JavaScript frameworks don't, don't do this. Um, it's really convenient because your code's all running on the server and it's stateful, right? Like you have, you can have state just sticking around on the server as you're interacting with the, the user. You can talk to your database directly because you're already on the server. So it's very convenient and productive for, for building uh, an app. Um, but the problem is it's also stateful. So if that state goes away for any reason, then the user can end up in a poor experience. Like, like you said, if the server gets restarted, um, any state that you had just sitting around in memory for that Blazor server app or interactive server rendering based uh, Blazor web app, um, there's nothing in Blazor that will persist that for you or try to rehydrate it. So if the server restarts, the user will see a disconnect, right? Because it's also a connected model. You require a, 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 that active WebSocket connection with the server in order for the UI to function. So the, the, the app will notice, hey, there's no longer a connection to the server. And it will let the user know and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer responsive. I'm, I'm trying to reconnect to the server. Let me see if I can get back again. Like maybe it was just a transient network connection. You went through a tunnel or, or whatever. Um, but if, if, if it wasn't just a transient connection, the when when the uh, browser re is able to finally reconnect again to the server when it restarts, it will ask the server, "Okay, reconnect me back to this particular. It's called a circuit, like the state that I was previously associated with." And the server will say, "I don't have it anymore because it's 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 gone." And now the, the the framework will then tell the user, "Like, hey, I'm sorry, I, I I was able to reconnect, but I couldn't reconnect back to your state." And so the only thing you can really really do at this point is refresh the browser and and start again. And this is a known you know pain point with Blazor server based based apps. If you're if you have um, you know anything that happens server side to that that circuit state can result in this user experience. So one of the things we're actually looking to do in .NET nine is is to improve that reconnection logic. Um, we're like there are a bunch of problems with it today. Like the reconnection is actually kind of slow. It only will try to reconnect like every twenty seconds. So the user even if the the servers come back up pretty quick. The user might sit there in that broken state for up to 20 seconds. That's not great. So we're going to reduce that. And who came up with the eight retries? I mean, no. these are these are so odd. Well, even but still, you know, we we have numbers. Right? 20 remember. seconds I get, but <laughs> we try one out of eight, two out of eight. I, I I'm always confused. Always yeah, confused. you know, default values are a funny thing, right? <laughs> sometimes they're a bit like uh, throwing darts at a dartboard. Our best guess, and uh, sometimes there's more principles that go go behind them. Um, you know, and this, I think this is the case where we shipped it, we shipped the reconnection experience that we currently have, and we have been learning from user feedback that there are, there are cases where it's problematic. I mean, of course you can configure all these things. Like you can configure what the, the retry duration is. You can configure how many times it retries. 
Um, there's also uh, how long the server will hold on to the circuit state when uh, when the client connection is lost. Um, like one one thing that often happens is like people will put a browser tab into the background, like uh, like swipe the browser away on your phone, for example. And on most platforms, that will actually close the WebSocket connection. Okay, so the server sees the connection is gone, and then it's like, well, I've got this circuit state here. Should I hold on to it? By default, Blazor server will it will it will hold on to it for a period of time. I think it's fairly short, like three minutes. But you don't generally want to hold on to it forever because then that becomes a potential you know DOS vector where people just keep creating connections and closing them, and now you've got all these circuits that are sticking around. You, you need to clean them up. Um, so if the user has swiped away for longer than three minutes and then comes back to the app, they might have that situation again where they connect to the server, try to get back to their circuit, and the circuit's no longer there. The server didn't restart. It just decided to get rid of the circuit because you you, you went away for, for, for too long. Um, so we're going to try and improve this the this the set of reconnection experiences the 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 UI that we actually show is is not particularly great and we're going to try and refine that and make it a little bit nicer we're going to shorten the reconnection period um, we'll start auto refreshing the browser for you so you don't have, like you can write that code today where it just automatically does the browser refresh for the user instead of just showing the user an error um, we're going to start just doing that by default because that's pretty much what everyone wants anyway and we're also going to try um, and do some client state persistence. Like if the user was in the middle of a form and typed a bunch of stuff, we'll try to at least save that and re-establish re it again in, into the form so that it's not lost. The one piece that we're not doing in .NET 9, which I'm you know, a little sad about that I really want to get to is, is helping facilitate saving the server state. Like if you were, if you had clicked the counter a bunch of times, let's say, and the count says, you know, 32 or whatever, and you're really proud that you clicked the counter 32 times, but then you swipe away and then come back and the circuit is gone, um, nothing will save the fact that the counter had 32 clicks on it. Um, you can write application code to, to do that. And we have some samples that show you some patterns that you can write in your app to, you know, persist state at particular moments and then rehydrate it again when the, the uh, a new circuit gets created. Um, but it's a bit tedious and there's some timing issues. Like we don't have all the right events that we really need the APIs in order to hook in and, and actually be able to persist state at all the appropriate moments. Um, that work is still pending and it's not going to make it in for, for, for .NET 9, we think. It's probably going to be, you know, again, dot, uh, dot .NET, uh, post .NET 9. I'm not going to commit to a particular release, but uh, that's the one part that I think people will still have to, to deal with in their own code is like persisting server-side state. So maybe like the old ASP.NET, you know, store state SQL server or some other, you know, server for the state versus the application server code is on one and states on another. Yes, it's, it's a similar like, like session state type of, if you want to have state that survives across um, requests in old, you know, in traditional static server side rendering based applications, you needed a store to put that thing in or you put in the cookie, right? You need some place to put it so that you can hang on to it. Um, it is similar and analogous in, in, in nature. It's not, it's not quite the same problem, but it has uh, similar characteristics. So, so are you looking in uh, server-side storage or are you maybe also leveraging, I don't know, local storage? I mean, especially when using the server interactive mode, you can have the protected local storage. So yeah, there might be a way, but of course, that only works so far as long yeah. as... Uh, you're, state. Uh, you're using that model, right? Yeah, there's, no, there's, it, yeah. It's a bit better than you state. It's a, a cross-site <laughs> scripting aware you state. That's um, yeah. We're definitely not going to. Uh, we're not going to try and like persist everything about the the state of the components for you. Like, there's not going to be a yeah. view state was kind of magical, right? Like, it, like web forms would try to just do this, like save everything, like, save everything, and then you would get into cases where people put too much stuff in there and it get enormous and it cause problems. Mm -hmm. The plan is that it will still be uh, an explicit developer decision how much you want to save. Um, we're just going to give you the API so that you can do that. Um, exactly where you store it, you know, like Redis or a database. Like, there's lots of options there, and there's always been like a like a plugin type of model where you 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 tell us where you want us to save things, and we maybe have some uh, recommended places that are more convenient that you can just just use. Um, whether you can store things on the client, like you you know put service move the service state to the client I, I, as you mentioned there's 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 limitations for for when you'd actually be able to do that are there any changes that are specific to affecting like blazer hybrid or blazer desktop whatever you want to call it 
So yeah, so um, the I mean the main thing for Blazor Hybrid that we're going to do is try and uh, give you a a template so that if you want to build for web, mobile, and desktop, that you don't have to piece that together manually. Like this is one of the beautiful things about Blazor Hybrid. Blazor Hybrid is a uh, for people that don't know that's that's a way you can take your existing Blazor components, the same ones you would use in your web app, and you can embed them into a native client app and render them to like a local web view control and use them as the UI layer for a native application, native desktop, native mobile. Uh, we have Blazor Hybrid support for .NET MAUI, so all the platforms that .NET MAUI supports. Uh, we also have uh, Blazor Hybrid support for WPF and, uh, and WinForms, so you can build you know, native Windows desktop apps using uh, this, this pattern. Um, and so you can today set it up yourself. You can create a, a Blazor web app, and you can create a Blazor Hybrid app, and then have like a common shared library of components that you use for both of them so that you have one set of components for your UI and you can then multi-target all the platforms that are that are interesting. Um, but it's very manual. Uh, in Don and I, we're gonna try and give you a, a pre-can template that will just do set that all up for you. There's some particular complexities that got introduced also with the with the render modes in Blazor Web Apps that, uh, that we're also going to address. Um, if you have a component right now that um, uh, has been attributed to say, I, I need to run on WebAssembly. And then you try to use that component in Blazor Hybrid. Well, Blazor Hybrid will say, this component says it needs to run on WebAssembly. And I'm not running it on WebAssembly, so it will throw. Um, we're going to do some work to relax some of those uh, constraints to make that easier and also give some uh, guidance and samples on how you can still uh, do this with even with .NET 8, um, with the uh, .NET 8 uh, implementation of the render modes. So that's the big thing there. There's I know there's also just general uh, investment happening for like desktop scenarios in .NET MAUI, uh, improvements to the uh, the web view controls like WebView 2. And uh, I know there's some issues with like drag and drop today with Blazor Hybrid and uh, in, and MAUI on Windows because of some issues with the WebView 2 control that the, the WinUI team is working on. And there's also a lot of like just docs and guidance work that's happening in the Blazor Hybrid space uh, to make it easier for you to uh, to to build your native client apps using web technologies. I'm interested to know uh, if there are any upcoming features or upcoming visions that are secret that you know about, that you're really excited about, that you can't talk about. <laughs> um, you know, mo I think everything that I would, if I were to list all the things I'm excited about, they're all, I think they're all public and most of them, I think they're all open source that the, that I'm aware of. So like like .NET Aspire and the cloud native work that that's happening, like that's super cool. Like being able to build uh, orchestrated, containerized cloud native apps using .NET in just a really easy way. Um, a lot of the work around AI, of course, is like super hot and amazing. Um, we just shipped a bunch of samples how to do uh, use the you know the open AI services with with .NET. Um, and, and actually, even more recently, we um, we just provided a set of experimental uh, Blazor and uh, MVC uh, uh, controls, like UI controls for doing AI things at, at the UI layer, like doing smart paste and smart uh, text areas and smart combo boxes. These are um, controls and components that, uh, that allow you to add AI-powered functionality to your app without having to know like everything about large language models and rag and prompt engineering and all the, all this stuff which is you know fun and interesting but if you're just trying to get the job done uh, can be a bit overwhelming uh, we've now have a bunch of controls you can just drop into an existing app and get some pretty uh, pretty amazing functionality like the the smart paste if you haven't seen the the video I strongly encourage you to go check out Steve Sanderson's uh, YouTube demo for this where like imagine you have a like an address form where you need to you know, put in all the fields, all the, you know, the street and city and zip code and all that stuff. And you're trying to put that in based off of some text that someone sent you in an email. So smart paste will allow you to just like you copy the, the text and you just click a smart paste button. And then we use the open AI services to correctly parse the text that you gave us and put the right data in each of the right fields semantically. Um, another cool demo he shows that's similar is like, imagine you're trying to submit a, a bug report and you got the bug report in an email from like one of your users and it's all in text. Uh, he shows just, he just copies the, basically the email text, smart paste into a, you know, a bug report form, like the, the GitHub uh, issue tracker UI or whatever. And it puts in all the right fields and the severity nice. markings and the repro steps are all nicely formatted. It's just <laughs> pretty amazing what the open AI stuff uh, can do. 
Um, the text area is like uh, smart com uh, completions or suggestions. Um, like uh, if you have you know forms that users are using that uh, like you know, HR answering questions from 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 employees or like a call center where they have fairly standardized answers that they need to give. Um, the uh, smart text area gives you a, a pre-canned way of having really intelligent uh, suggestions as you're like typing to help you quickly type out those things. Uh, semantic search. Uh, these are all just a set of pre-canned uh, AI-powered UI controls that you can just use today. So definitely check that out. There's a, a, re it's a, it's a public re uh, repo with sample code. Uh, and if you find them interesting, they are currently experimental because we're trying to learn here, like, well, which smart controls would actually, smart components would actually be useful and what do people actually want to do with them? There's a survey link in the smart components repo and in the blog post. I would love it if you would uh, would take and let us know what you think about uh, that that control set. So those those are all cool, and they're and they're they're public. They're not secret. Um, all, everything we're doing in .NET nine is again it's open source. It's public. It's not secret. And we invite you. You know, come 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 help us out. Come come join us in the in the fun. I, I didn't get a chance to talk about the WebAssembly investments. So I do want to make sure I mention those because we are doing oh, we some new time. things in WebAssembly. Um, the uh, the big one is is uh, we're trying to get multi-threading going in, in Blazor in, in .NET 9. If you've been following Blazor, this has been a, quite a journey. Like we've been working on this for, for years, honestly. Um, but the runtime work is, is, is in, in good shape. Um, the, 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 getting the runtime to actually support uh, initiating new uh, multiple threads and having it run in a separate uh, uh, worker thread so that we don't block the, the main UI thread. Uh, the big work items that's still remaining there is uh, to get Blazor when it's running on WebAssembly to not make any single threaded assumptions. Um, that's a big chunk of work. So I, I don't know that we'll actually land it as a, um, part, as a stable supported feature in .NET 9, but I'm hoping it'll at least be available for you to, to use and, 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 and try out. We've had it available for at the lower level, like where you could write some like very low level .NET code and use multi-threading. We've never gotten it fully functioning in the Blazor environment yet. That's where we're trying to get to in the, the .NET 9 time. Yeah, my take on it is that uh, Daniel's hiding secrets behind things he's really excited about. <laughs> That's what I think. He's excited about other stuff. He just hasn't told you yet. Uh, you know, I, I, to be completely transparent and honest, like I, I work primarily in the public open source sphere. So you know, almost everything that I work on is... Is is yeah. not not secret. I'm happy and happy to talk about it. Like it's no. It's I think seriously. I I think it speaks to the cadence, doesn't it? I think it really speaks to the cadence at which things are coming out and the manner in which they're coming out. The open source and, manner and the development philosophy. Like like pretty much everything I I, I do. We, the code is available for you to look at, to inspect, to uh, to clone and build yourself. Uh, to to con contributions to. Like it's a very Community centric way of doing software development, and that's that's a key part of what we do in the the, the .NET world. Like .NET is an open source, community driven uh, platform, so yeah, there shouldn't be any secrets. Like you know, .NET platform is uh, is owned by, in some sense, by by all of us. So can I can I ask a specific uh, planning planning question, maybe? Uh, so uh, in, in in .NET eight, one of the uh, new features for Blazor was in terms of authentication with the updates to the template using uh, using ISPIN and ident core identity. And I think also the new identity API endpoints, right? Slash register, slash login. Now, I remember that those new endpoints, they were marked as experimental when .NET 8 came out. So like might be subject to change. So what's coming in .NET 9, will that stay the same? Will, will Blazor change something in terms of authentication? What's what are the plans there? I mean, uh, uh, .NET 9 is uh, uh, seven and a half months probably away, right? So um, yeah, probably also a matter of time. So in .NET 8, there was a ton of work that went into improving the authentication story with ASMIC Core. Um, we moved away from, we moved more to like a back-end for front-end pattern for a lot of our authentication flows. Uh, previously, we were using uh, more like uh, token acquisition and OIDC directly from different clients in order to handle that. Um, we ended up moving a, a away from that from, from that for various reasons. Much much better, uh, yes. So that that's that's all still in place, and then we'll continue to to exist. We also introduced the um, Blazor identity components. Uh, previously, when you were using ASMIC core identity for handle authentication within your own app, 
Uh, we gave you like a default UI for doing login and logout and external logins and uh, two-factor auth and all those types of things. And it was all built with Razor pages. Uh, and if you were a Blazor user, this this caused some some friction. Like uh, people didn't like the fact that they were having to mix these two different UI frameworks in the same app. Uh, so in .NET uh, uh, in .NET 8, we introduced uh, a set of Blazor components that, as part of the templates that uh, implement the same UI functionality. In Visual Studio, there's actually now a, um, a a scaffolder, a new Blazor identity scaffolder that we've introduced that you can use to add the Blazor identity components to an existing uh, ASP.NET Core app or Blazor app to get the, those components in, uh, included in your app without having to do file new projects. So that's that's also there. Um, I know we also have uh, work. There's work still in progress on our um, Microsoft Entra support. Um, Entra is the if you, Entra is the new brand for the Azure Active Directory or Azure Active Directory via B B to C. You know the organizational based uh, account uh, authentication. Um, we didn't get the option in the Blazor web app template in .NET 8 for turning on like Microsoft Identity Platform based authentication or Entra based auth uh, in the, the the template. So we're working to get that template work done. So you have tooling to help you uh, set up that style of authentication and also samples and guidance so that you can do it today with your existing uh, .NET 8 based based applications. So that's also coming as well as the um, tooling in Visual Studio for adding. Microsoft Entra based authentication into an existing app, similar to like scaffolding, but uh, I think it's done through the add connected services based based flow. The identity endpoints question is interesting. I actually had I, I, I didn't think that they had been marked as. Uh, I as, thought it was mentioned when when it was released, but um, so, sorry if I should be wrong. But um, let me just double check. I'm gonna ping some yeah, let's, on let's, the fly. Let's, let's double check. <laughs> But but really, it sounded like yeah, that's so. So they are new, and maybe they change, maybe they won't. But um, again, from what I understand, I, I mean, I may have this wrong. Uh, it's not it's not exactly my my area. I do work closely with yeah, this okay, thing. But I, I thought the new uh, identity endpoints, the programmatic ways of interacting with ASP.NET Core identity, that they had actually shipped in 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 Dominate and were supported. Um, check me on that if I'm wrong. Um, okay. But I believe they they were, and that's useful for things like. Uh, where you do need to have a token-based flow, like if you have a like a .NET MAUI uh, based client and you want to get a you know, token so that you can call some some API endpoints, those identity endpoints are are, are useful for that still. Uh, so I think they are available, um, and yeah, they they will continue to to exist. But I'll double check on that, and we can can take those questions off. Yeah, of yeah. So, so I, sorry, sorry if I should spread the misinformation, but I think it, it, I, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was like, okay, early work, give us your feedback, stuff like that. So maybe that early work meant the API endpoints are fixed, but that's not the end of the line and there will be more becoming. I, I, I'm not sure about that, but I was I was just wondering, right? Because uh, again, it was, it was labeled as early work or something, right? So I was just wondering, will I need to update my code? Um, but uh, you, sounds like I don't have to win, 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 so Exactly. I mean, <laughs> as, as, you, as you just said at, at, at the beginning, right? That that's that's the Microsoft credo of uh, of having this backwards compatibility. I was I was reading the the tweet by I think Dave Dave Plummer last week when he told the story how he built that format disk Windows UI. You know these if you format, you know, a thumb drive or something, or even your hard drive, that, that formatting UI in Windows, he built that 30 years ago. So now if you have Windows 11, try to format a thumb drive, it will look exactly the same. And he kind of explains how he built this, again, 30 plus years ago, and still hasn't changed, still working. It's a bit different with Blazor, right? So that, that did evolve quite a bit from, from being a conference demo in 2017 to now being a fully fledged framework that's still innovating. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the front end web development space moves very fast. Like yeah. uh, the, the innovation is is uh, moves at a breakneck next speed, and we understand that. Like, well, like you know, we've been talking about back compatibility. Like one of the things we try very hard, actually, across the .NET platform and in Blazor, is to make sure that you can upgrade from version to version without having a lot of a lot of pain. And we, like, I know in a lot of the front end world, um, when moving from with other frameworks, this, this can be a big problem. Like I'm moving from one major version to another and I end up having to do a lot of uh, code changes to, 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 to upgrade. We want that to, to never, that should never be the case at this point with, uh, with, with Blazor application. You can adopt the framework and feel comfortable that you should be able to move it forward 
uh, fairly seamlessly and take advantage of new .NET platform features without having to like rewrite your app. I mean, the Blazor web app stuff is a, is is a something you opt into. Like you can choose to 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 migrate to those to those features, but you don't have to. Like there's nothing. If you're happy with your Blazor server app today, there's no requirement to turn that into a like you know interactive server rendering based uh, Blazor web app. Um, I did. Ch- I was just checking on the. Um, uh, the release notes documentation that we have for .NET 8 and the uh, a, uh, identity API endpoints absolutely are are there, so they are part of the uh, the, the shipped and supported uh, functionality in, in, in .NET 8. Okay, so that that will stay the same for the foreseeable future. Okay, that's that's fantastic to hear. So the the early work basically meant okay, there might be more more to come apart from register, login, and logout. Yeah, there might be more more functionality that they plan to add. I mean, we, we can just uh, augment the existing uh, end, endpoints. Um, although even that, I'm not I'm not familiar with any uh, uh, significant things that are happening in the .NET nine timeframe to add to the identity endpoints. Um, but again, not 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 strictly speaking my area, so this might be something I'm just not familiar with. But you can always find out by uh, looking in the GitHub repo and seeing what the devs are working on, because like I said, none of it's secret. Yeah, <laughs> it's all it's all right there. So before we uh, wrap up and move on to picks, uh, can I have AI write? My Blazor app for me, so I can just do more with less. You can do quite. You can do quite a bit. Like you can use GitHub Copilot in Visual Studio and ask it to do things for you, and it will absolutely write a lot of your code. It's pretty. It's pretty good. It's pretty uh, uh, amazing, actually, how much it can uh, figure out about what what your intent is. I mean, it's not not going to be perfect, so make sure you check your code, read it over. Um, you know, uh, don't just blindly copy and paste, but you can actually get a lot out of the uh, the GitHub Copilot functionality. Um, have you, have you ever, I know David Fowler's done some really fun uh, demos where he shows like David David Fowler's an architect on the .NET team and he is a very active proponent of using GitHub Copilot and he uses it uh, uh, tons in his own development efforts working on .NET Aspire and working on the the the, the framework. So if if that's any inspiration, like it is it is real. Like the it's not it's not just hype. Like the the, the productivity gains from using GitHub Copilot are pretty. Be striking. Okay, so anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to s- stick in here before we move on to picks? I'll, I'll also make one more mention on WebAssembly, which is on the. We know that uh, one of the downsides of .NET on WebAssembly is the the load time of the app, right? Like people worry uh, concerned about the size of the download, how long that takes, uh, and then getting the app to actually uh, load up. We are doing a bunch of work in in .NET nine to to speed that up. Um, it's not so much uh, in the past we've we've focused on reducing the size like how much how small can we shrink this thing you know we use c- compression and trimming and all these tricks to try and get the .NET runtime and the core .NET libraries as, as small as possible um, in .NET eight we did some actually some some uh, cool trickery where we uh, we could try to hide the download time of the Blazor WebAssembly app. By using this auto render mode, where you you start an interactive component using the the interactive server model, which is you know just requires a WebSocket connection, while you sneak down the Blazor WebAssembly runtime in the background, and then on subsequent renders, when the when the uh, WebAssembly runtime is available, then you, it switches over to use uh, true client side rendering. So you get the fast fast initial load, um, while also uh, uh, being able to move the 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 the, the, you know, the burden of operating that code to to the client. Um, in .NET 9, we're going to do some optimizations around how those files get retrieved, like how the static web assets get get handled. Um, today, there's kind of a cascade of requests that that happen as part of loading up that Blazor WebAssembly app. Um, we're going to be doing things at build time to uh, optimize how that load happens, so we can add like link tags and start using pre preloading techniques, so that those requests can all just sort of happen in in, in parallel. Um, we're going to do more with uh, pre-compression. Uh, pre-compression has a build time optimization we do where we take your web assets and run broadly compression on them really aggressively so that they're already compressed and ready to go once your app is deployed. That feature right now is limited to you know, some Blazor WebAssembly specific files in .NET 9 that will expand to more of the assets that are being downloaded. Like you can pre-compress your JavaScript files, your CSS files and so forth and get that that added benefit. Um, we're doing some you know, more modern bundling techniques with our own um, Blazor framework files, like blazor.web.js, like making that file smaller, um, just optimizing how the static web assets come down. And then also the 
once you have everything downloaded, it getting the .NET runtime started actually is takes a little bit of time. Like getting it uh, running, like you know, you say WebAssembly code start start running. Like the, from there to when you actually have your .NET code executing fully and handling events has a little bit of delay. Um, we're working to reduce that startup time uh, even further, both the, the Blazor initialization code and also the startup time of the, the .NET runtime itself. So the idea is that hopefully the the total time from you know when you hit the page, get all the files downloaded, get them cached, get the runtime up and up and going, that that lo total load time will be as as fast as possible. So a bunch of work happening in the uh, in the load time optimization space as well. Could it throw the runtime into local storage so it only has to get it the first time, or if there's any changes? We so we already do that. We don't we don't put it in local. We put it in the uh, the cache. We use the caching APIs cache, yeah. to store those files locally. And um, um, in fact, one of the optimizations that that we'll, we're going to do in .NET nine is we're going to start fingerprinting every single static asset so that it has a unique hash that, that's that's generated from its content in the file name. And then we'll use um, uh, other browser caching techniques in .NET nine to tell the browser like, hey, you've got this once, don't ever download it again. Um, we'll use we'll ge we'll generate e tags based off of that same hash as well. So. If you can't use like the immutable browser caching, um, you can still fall back to the e tag behavior. So that that actually basically already exists with .NET eight, where you once you've downloaded it, downloaded it once, uh, you don't need to download it again. So it's really just the first load that uh, Blazor WebAssembly apps are are heavily impacted by. But even that first load, we care about. So that's that's why we're doing all these other optimizations in .NET nine. Got it. Cool. Yeah, and I think local storage wouldn't work because there are size limitations and it's a string API essentially, right? So that wouldn't be as efficient as um, the, the built-in browser caching. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, that said, let's uh, go ahead and move on to picks. Uh, Christian, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, since we were talking about uh, Microsoft SPA frameworks, I thought I would talk about the previous Microsoft SPA framework. So, what was so Daniel? What would you say was what's the predecessor of uh, Blazor? The biggest inspiration from Blazor, I would say, does come from React. Like, if you look at Blazor and Squint, oh, okay. it looks very React-like in its methodology. And you're absolutely right. But uh, I was, uh, I was, I was, I was hinting at some, some, some Microsoft technologies. So of course, I'm talking about Silverlight today. Oh. So I, <laughs> we don't talk about. I, I don't know why you're all laughing now. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I told the embarrassing story, right? That I think I once even even did a book on that uh, when we had Richard Campbell on. I was kind of arm wrestled into telling that story. But uh, last month there was a new release of uh, Open Silver, OpenSilver.net. So what they're essentially doing, and I thought that's why it's a good pick for today when when Daniel's on the show, is basically they're using Blazor WebAssembly to run existing Silverlight and WPF apps in the browser. So they now have F-sharp support. Uh, I think they run the Silverlight toolkits with, I think, zero code changes or very little code changes. Uh, so actually, uh, a, a customer of mine who was, was stuck with, with an old uh, Silverlight app, they, they have been using that to kind of don't want to say save their project, but uh, essentially they, they were able to to reuse their their existing uh, their existing code, and um, so uh, I found that pretty amazing. It's also, that this this project is is still active, and well, again had a release in uh, early February. So that's my pick. For Christian, I have to I have to tell you the little, little background there. So yeah, please do. You know, one one of the funny things, like we we get asked a lot about like you know is blazer going to be the next silver light like are you going to is like a silver light you know had an unfortunate and end of life and then people get nervous because of the the similarities they see there um the same the the dotnet web assembly runtime that we build for blazer mm -hmm. is the same dotnet web assembly runtime mm -hmm. that open silver uses to create a silver light experience in in the browser so in some sense Blazor is responsible for resurrecting Silverlight again <laughs> through the. Open oh, you're growing your own competition. Right. Is that? <laughs> I mean, we can't reclaim credit for. It. Obviously, the, the the maintainer of that project he does amazing. They, the, that team does amazing work, and they've done a phenomenal job helping uh, existing Silverlight customers. But uh, yeah, under the covers, under the hoods, it's Blazor. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think I'll go next this time. So my pick this week is called Ratio. It's a smart uh, sprinkler controller for your 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 lawn, and if you got an automated sprinkler system, and the old ones were just set on timers, just on off on off whatever days you want. And about eight ten years ago, I bought this Ratio Ratio whatever you want to call it 
smart controller. And just a couple of weeks ago, they sent me an email that says, hey, your controller is really old. Why don't you take 50% off a new controller? I said, sure. So since my green uh, grass is starting to grow and it's springtime and things like that. So I went for that and I really like it because, you know, you can, it's smart. It knows the weather. It knows humidity, temperature, wind, all that kind of stuff that takes it into account of when to run your sprinklers and when to not. You tell it the slope for this zone. You tell it the type of soil for this zone. And it just does all the AI generated controlling of your sprinkler heads. And so saved you a lot of water and, and some money there. So try it out. All right, Mark, you will know what's your pick. Uh, uh, there we go. I think I'm unmuted. Um, my pick is uh, a sweet TV show on Apple TV called Trying. Um, it's about a sweet couple that do sweet t- things for each other. They're trying to have a baby. Uh, and by the way, kids, if you like sobbing like a baby, this is the show for you. If you've got someone like a partner in your family, somebody who likes to sob when people do sweet things, this is the show. I'll often walk in on my wife and she's crying, just crying uncontrollably. And I know what she's doing. She's watching this show. Um, it's actually really, really sweet. Great, uh, uh, a great vision uh, from the creator behind it. Uh, and uh, I've, I've been really impressed with how it, it's able, even me, an autistic robot man, still I could get me and I'd be like, oh, man. So, yeah, it's a pretty good show. All right, cool. All right, Adam, what's your pick? So my pick for this week is software again. So we probably know SSH and PowerShell remoting and other stuff for controlling remote hosts. But there is still this old good old tool called PSExec. If you have never heard about that, this is a nice trickery from SysInternals that lets you actually execute commands on remote hosts with nothing. The only thing you just need is like be able to share files, which Windows has enabled by default. And it does some black magic behind the scenes to install the service that lets you do even interactive shell over there. So you can use it. And when can it be helpful? Well, sometimes we just forget to install OpenSSH or PowerShell remoting server. PSExec still does the magic. So go check it out. It can really save you when you are in big troubles. It still works. And I don't know how many decades it has been, but it looks like it's going to work with Windows, whatever comes after 11. I, I'm uh, proud to say I, I shook Mark Rusinovich's hand two weeks ago, totally fanboying, uh, because all of these system tunnels tools, they have, as, as, as for you, they've saved me so, so much, so much time on so many instances. And they are still maintained, right? Okay, Daniel. Do you I have, have to come with one? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna go some with something old school here. I, I, um, my, my, my wife and my kids had never seen the movie uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey. Do you guys know this movie? It's Arthur C. Clarke, old classic. And so I said, "Oh, we have to, we have to sit down and watch this." And uh, that has been just a super fun experience. Like this, the whole opening. If you haven't seen the movie. You should I'm go sorry, see it. A, think of it as poetry, <laughs> science, science poetry. <laughs> the apes and the bones. And oh, the yes. The problems. apes were, there was lots of commentary during the, the whole ape scene and the music and the. That, the that movie, I think that movie still holds the record for the furthest distance in a jump cut that's ever been traveled through time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, we haven't actually finished it yet, so they haven't seen the ending. So you know, shh, don't 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 spoil it for them. But I'm actually really looking forward for them to seeing the psychedelic like ending sequence <laughs> that comes in 2001. So yeah, that's my that's my pick. Then you're gonna watch 2010. I don't know. Like it's a very different experience, right? Like maybe, yeah. maybe but at least they got the they've seen how right. And, you know, hello day. You know that whole experience. So culturally, they've been. They've been, they've been, they've learned now what the, what, what the way computers, computers might be. <laughs> I guess it's kind of uh, relevant in the, the new AI world, you know, like <laughs> where, where are we headed here? All right. 
Thanks, Daniel, for coming on the, sh on the show. Uh, let's not wait so long next time, you know? Happy to be here. Happy to come back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you. For our listeners who want to get in touch with the show, if you got feedback or ideas for uh, topics, they can reach out to me. I am on all the platforms. I am at .NET Superhero. Thanks, and we'll catch you all in the next episode of Adventures in .NET.